Hi, welcome back. Uh, this week we have um, two lectures and um, no demo. So we're going to start off by talking about scale and proportion, and then we'll move on to the second lesson about the topic of rhythm within artwork, and that's the one that your homework will relate to. Okay, so um, first we'll cover proportion. The term proportion refers to um, the scaling up or scaling down of something and keeping it in the same sort of ratio. So for example, here we see a um, miniature train set. And if we wanted to model one of these little trains off of a real train that existed in the world, we'd make, need to make sure that we reduced it kind of equally all across. Because for instance, if you were to take the, the real train and reduce the front of it by a certain um, number of times and the back of it by a different number of times, then it could end up looking really skewed and warped. And so um, something that's very small could be in proportion to something that's very large if um, both of them have the same sort of ratio to each other rather than you know varying that quite a bit. Okay. Now, um, some people uh, throughout history have believed in this idea of ideal proportions. As you might think about Leonardo with the, the Vitruvian man. And of course, nowadays we don't think about ideal proportions with human beings because it's sort of sexist and racist and just stupid. <laughs> there's all kinds of different people, there's no ideal. Um, but there are some systems of proportions um, that we do see actually in science and nature. And one of them, one interesting one um, is this idea of the golden mean. And so if we look at the box at the top, um, okay, get ready for a little math here, the B section the A section on the very top, okay? The B is to the A what A is to A plus B. All right, so I'm gonna say it again. The B is to the A in terms of how much space it would take up within the A. If you were to take the B section and move it over to the A, the amount of space that it would take up within A is the same amount of space that A would take up within a plus B, okay? So now if these are um, repeated over and over in a sort of um, turning motion like you see below, we end up with the kind of curve that you see in nautilus shells, you see in the insides of sunflower seeds, the way that the seeds curl in. Um, and so this is really kind of an exciting thing. Um, so looking below, we see, you can actually see a bit of the Nautilus type of shell here. And what the person uh, who designed this has done is connected all the, cor the corners across, and that's how you end up with the curve. Um, but looking at it, let's look at the very top uh, of it. The, this section, if you were to move it over into this section, takes up the same amount of space as in the second section across the entire thing. And then we do it again this way. And we do it again this way. And we do it again this way and so on and so forth. And that's how you create this sort of thing. And so artists um, have at times used these sorts of um, proportions that are found in nature in artwork. So for instance, um, I used to live in, and in design. Uh, I used to live in uh, Bristol in the United Kingdom. And there I lived in a Georgian apartment. It was an old Georgian house that got turned into, you know, multiple apartments um, in modernity. And so the Georgian architects often um, would create their windows within the overall um, width of the walls to kind of match this sort of proportion. The windows would take up a certain amount of space within the overall wall relating to this. And it was nice because it made the window is quite big um, compared to other, you know, forms of architecture, and we had a lot of light in the in the place. So that's an example. <laughs> now let's talk. Uh, let's get away from proportion and move into scale. And so with um, scale, this just refers to size. And so let's think about something very iconic. Like, what's the most iconic artwork you can think of? Probably the Mona Lisa. All right. So because the Mona Lisa looms large in our minds, I think a lot of the time we assume that it's big, but if you actually go to see it in the Louvre in Paris, you'll see that it's actually a very small painting. And it's also very hard to get to because there's usually a lot of people in the room that you have to try to get through to get to see it. 
Um, and so I find that really surprising, but, but we have um, come to misunderstand uh, sizes of artworks more recently, I mean, because of phones. You know, we're looking at everything really small. And we might look at um, a bunch of artworks together in a PowerPoint like we do here, and I don't necessarily scale them exactly to the sizes that they would be next to each other. So it gives a really off um, understanding of the sizes of things, seeing them um, electronically or seeing even them in old print, print books, right? One um, term, one vocab term uh, around this idea of the size of an artwork is this idea of human scale. An artwork that is made in human scale or a design that exists is printed in human scale is one in which it's easy for humans to interact, okay? That is opposed to something like land art. Um, this is spiral jetty. And if you look below, you can see little tiny people walking in it. And so this is very much like the geoglyphs that we saw with the uh, Nazca civilization and with um, the chalk drawings in um, England. And so some contemporary artists also use this idea of making really quite large things you could be seen from the, from the only from um, airplanes. And so we wouldn't necessarily say that this is in human scale because we couldn't see it all at once unless we were up in the air like that. This is like a massive land art. So how does scale affect the way that we relate to an artwork? And does an artwork scale help us to feel certain emotions in relation to it? So. Have a look at this painting of mine. You might be watching on your laptop. You might be watching on your phone. Um, so you have absolutely no idea if it's big or small. Take a guess. Imagine about what size you think this is. Well, it is uh, about this size in proportion to my body. It's 45 by 92. So assuming it was hung about a foot off from the bottom of the wall, like not right against the wall, but a foot up at the bottom then I'd go up to about this size against this artwork. It's really big. But it was commissioned uh, by Bristol Cathedral for a temporary exhibition there. And I don't know if you can even see it, but here it is. <laughs> I did a pano of it above and below um, and right and left, just to so, show you how incredibly big the space is. And so that's why I made it large because when it was installed in this space, it looked really small. You can imagine if it was any smaller, it would um, completely be very, very hard to find. <laughs> it wouldn't blend, it wouldn't um, stand out very much. Here we have a very much larger artwork, a mural that I think some of us would recognize because it's in downtown Pittsburgh, showing uh, Rachel Carson, um, Roberto Clemente and Andy Warhoff to kind of looking at across at those bridges named after those people. And this was um, designed by Joshua Chang and Eric Roman. Okay. And so one reason to make something really, really big is because it's for public consumption. You know, it's made for the public like this particular piece and you want lots of people to notice. Here is another mural that you can get to from that mural in about five minutes walking. It's um, underneath the Point Park on the side that faces the north side. And this was made in uh, the summer of 2020. And something very interesting about this piece is, and I should mention that it's one really long piece. It's, it's, uh, so these are just three images stacked of the much longer um, piece. And one thing that's interesting about this is that it is really large. And so you can see it from the north side, it's super noticeable, which is pretty much you know, the point you want people to see it. Um, but um, after the original block letters were added, um, a Pittsburgh artist, um, Cam Camo Nesbitt, um, said that, you know, the, he would like to uh, allow more people to work on it because the original Black Lives Matter uh, letters were created by artists who were not Black. And so he said that he sort of appreciated the, um, solidarity, but he wanted uh, Black artists to have the chance to um, alter the image in ways they wanted, and the city agreed. And so he got a whole group of artists from the city uh, together to work on this. And so it added um, lots of details to it. And so 
uh, not just the details that we could see here with the snake and the flowers and, and the um, cat head, but also the columns that hold up the um, the road above also had portraits painted on them by artists too. And so it really alters the look of the, the piece and made it a lot more interesting. So with that, we can see it really far away. It's a large piece, but it's also a small piece with lots of details if you're on the other side. So if you're close to it, you can't read you can't read the entire um, statement at once, but you can see all the neat details and all of the kind of embellishments and extra portraits and things that are a lot smaller within it. So it's both something that should be seen close up and seen from the other side of the river far back, and you get a very different experience from both. Here's a, a piece that we looked at in the last lecture. We talked about the stitching in the pants and how very detailed it is, but it's also really big. And so you might not have realized that when you first saw it last week. And I think having it large makes it all the more sort of impressive in, in its detail and its kind of beauty. It makes the person want to stand back and also get really close and see the details. This is the Wrath of the Medusa by Jericho, and there are other reasons why an artist might want to make a work really large other than making it kind of impressive and it's um, impressive or um, noticeable. Another reason might be that it has a dramatic subject matter, and so um, the artist might want to push the, the viewer away instead of like drawing them in, make them stand back and kind of gasp, you know, <laughs> and that's something that happens more with something that's really grand and large, I should say this painting is really, really big in real life, um, than with something kind of small and precious. And so here we have a, a bust of the Emperor Constantine, and he was the first Roman emperor to convert to Christianity, and that wasn't really popular, but he decided, um, I think his mother converted him, and he decided that the whole empire was going to convert to Christianity and he forced that upon his subjects. And so this was once huge. You can see that now it's in ruins. Um, a person would be able to probably stand um, probably up to the top where his um, head, where his uh, neck starts. So that would be, be a whole height of the person. So you can imagine this once it was assembled was huge, um, particularly for the time period. It would have been a hell of a feat to accomplish this, something that large. And so he's also, he's looking up because, you know, this reference is looking up to, to heaven, but um, he's also just so imposing. And so if you were a person who didn't want to have your religion converted by force um, and you came up, you know, you thought about uprising maybe, and you came across this and saw it, you would say, okay, this person has incredible strength. This person is um, like unchallengeable, right? So um, frightening. Now, why might you want to make something small if there are benefits to making something large? Like it's noticeable, um, it's impressive. Why would you not want to be noticeable and, impress and impressive? Um, well, uh, miniatures can be impressive in their own ways. So um, below you see a, uh, it's called a book of hours and these were illuminated manuscripts uh, which means the entire thing is written out by hand and the, the paintings are done by hand. And these were done in the Middle Ages in Europe. Um, and there were also illuminated manuscripts done in um, ancient um, near Middle East as well. Uh, for some Persian, there's some really beautiful Persian um, illuminated manuscripts too. But um, these particular types of illuminated manuscripts were these tiny little books that women who were part of the aristocracy in Europe during the Middle Ages kept, and they they were basically a calendar book, but they had a prayer for each day, and so it would be a way to keep track with where we are in the year, but it was also a way to be devotional in their spirituality. But obviously, they were really, really expensive to commission because it's all completely done by hand. That would take somebody years to make one of these things. Um, and so they're impressive in their absolute detail, but the overall feeling that a miniature gets, whether it's impressive or not, is that it's kind of precious. 
right? And so think about lockets. You've got little tiny pictures of your family, and it's not necessarily something you'd want to put on the side of your house, a picture of your kid for all the people who are not related to your family to see. But you want it, you want it to be personal. You want it to be precious. You want it to be, um, you know, just for you. And so sometimes it makes sense to make artwork that is small or that is a little bit more subtle, depending on its um, purpose. And then there are things that are small and public. You know, we were just talking about things that are kind of private that only one or two people have access to, but there are also smaller scale artwork um, out there in the world that anybody could find. It wouldn't be nearly as noticeable as a big mural, like some of the uh, murals we looked at in Pittsburgh here. But um, here's an example that you might have seen around the city. Uh, I don't know who this person is because it's unattributed. Um, but this kind of smug looking mustachioed guy is a particular um, design that is all over the city. And the name Mike Bone is written here and it's written next to some of them, but other names are written next to the mustachioed guys in other, uh, in other instances of this uh, graffiti art. And so um, it has a very different feeling when you come across one because Often they're sort of hidden around the corner in an, in an alley or on the side of a bridge that it's, it's kind of small and not that noticeable. And so when you do find it, it's almost like a little like Easter egg. You know? um, so here's another artwork that I did years ago that is a miniature. It's a set of nine and all together it makes one artwork. And um, the idea behind this artwork was that the bases, the compositions are all based on things from my childhood. Like for instance, um, the far left middle, the composition is of a rose window because there's a, um, a church in front of my parents' house. So there's a rose window in it. Um, the one uh, below that one in the bottom left corner is a VFW symbol. Like it was a big thing in my little town that I came from. And so all of these structurally in terms of the shapes within them, are from my childhood and all of the patterns on top of them are things that I encountered when I was um, living abroad and traveling. So kind of filling in from my adult life. Now, these are about, these are four inches across from the, the entire width of the circles are four inches across. And so I wanted them to be small because it's a personal thing to me. It's sort of about my biography. And so I thought making it like a precious kind of size would be nice. It would draw people in, like only one or two people could see it at a time when it's showing in a gallery. They have to get really, really close to see all the details. Unfortunately, I made them circles and because they're four, four inches across, people often say that they look like coasters, which is, which is not really what I was going for. So we have to take all these design elements into consideration. So here is another artwork of mine and it is this big compared to my size, 20 by 16. Now I was approached by the airport and they asked me if I would be willing to um, have this reproduced large scale in the airport. And I said, sure. And they said, well, we have to turn it sideways. And normally, <laughs> normally I wouldn't be cool with that, but um, I looked at it sideways too. And it also looked, I thought it looked just as good. So I was all right with that. And so look how very different the piece feels um, from that last slide to this. Just the act of increasing it and putting it in a public place changes the meaning. Now all of a sudden it, it looks like the um, the stamens and whatever they're called, the parts that come off uh, to pollinate the pagri lilies um, are a, little, a lot more um, intense than they were in the last one. It looks like something that's almost shooting off at me. So um, again, we talked about um, Scale and proportion, uh, scale meaning size. We talked about all these other topics. So take a screenshot of this so you can um, look back and remember later what these were. And if you don't remember what any of these are right now, you wanna go back and watch that part of the video. And now we're gonna be moving on to the next topic uh, for today, which is rhythm. The next lesson of the day, which um, is about rhythm in art. And so you probably think of the word um, rhythm in relation to music, and it certainly is um, relevant to music. We, um, the rhythm would be the, the kind of the beat of the, of the song. And so 
the beat of a song is composed of three things the kind of the gaps between the notes you know how much how the duration of the spaces between notes um, also the emphasis of the notes and the duration of the notes how long is the note right and so if we had no variation and every note had the same amount of space between them and every note um, was as long as the others and every note was the same was emphasized similarly none were louder none were quieter and they're all the same um you know they're all the same note then it would just it wouldn't really be rhythm it would just be repetition it would be like this not exactly a song is it it's more just like somebody clapping so let's think about a song um, that we might all recognize like we three kings Okay, I'm going to try to whistle it. I'm not the best whistler, but it's something like this. Right? And so you'll notice that that very first note, we three kings, that first note, it's louder than the others. It also is a little bit longer than some of the other notes. We, um, we hear that long note come back again. And bear and gifts, you know, so that's a little bit of a repetition, but it's not quite as emphasized as the first note. So the first note really, really hits us. And then there's a variation between the um, the gaps between those. And that's what starts to create the sense of a rhythm. And in artwork, it's exactly the same. Um, so let's look at this Primavera painting by Botticelli. And you'll notice that there is, um, there are spaces between the figures. So this would be similar to the kind of duration between the notes. And um, some figures touch, they're really close together. And so we could think of these um, three ladies here kind of as a grouping or three notes that are really fast, like boom, boom, boom. Um, we also notice that we've got three figures touching over here. And so, and we've got two solitary figures with space around them. Well, he's touching her a little bit, but not by too much. Okay. And so we've got a bit of a pattern set up here where we have a dominant note with the, the gentleman touching the oranges. And then we have a space. And we've got three quick notes together. We've got a space. We've got the um, focal point. So that lesson from last week will really come in handy here as well. You know, remember that we talked about how if there's space around a figure, it more clearly makes it um, obviously the focal point. And then we have another grouping of, uh, of three people kind of overlapping uh, quicker notes too. And we could say that certain notes are more emphasized also because of the height. You can see that the guy in the red takes up more space. He, his hand is way up in the air. Um, so he's like a higher note. We also see that um, the woman in the middle, um, the focal point, she also is higher up where the other six figures are a little bit lower down on the, um, on the picture plane, right? And so we've got certain notes that are more emphasized. We've got spaces between I should, sorry, not notes, <laughs> thinking of music here. We've got spaces between the objects and um, we have kind of a structured variation. They're not all exactly the same, right? When there is a big break in the structured variation um, that's quite different than everything else, we would refer to that as a staccato element and the same um, language is used in music. And so here we see a De Chirico piece and you can see lots of archways. They come up this way, they go back down this way, they go back up that way. It's a really um, clear, um, kind of structure happening here in, in the repetition of the arches. And then we get to this part where we can see through one of the, um, the arches to a factory in the background. We get a little bit of a, um, um, an accent of that over here as well. But we could say that these, because they kind of break the overall structure, um, are the kind of staccato elements or the, the parts that make it a little bit more exciting, um, break it up a little bit, make it more fun. Okay, so rhythm can is often used in uh, op art, and op, not pop art, but op art, which is stands for optical art that makes you um, see vibration in it. And so here is a piece um, where you can see that the um, the curves get a lot closer together towards the bottom, and so we start to have a faster rhythm towards the bottom, 
we have a slower kind of current up here. Do you see this sort of vibration that's happening in this piece? What I want you to focus on um, with your rhythm project, though, is really this idea of mood. And we talked about mood uh, several times in the class before, even just earlier in this own, in this very video, we were talking about how the size of an artwork can really change the mood. You know, something small being precious, something large being imposing and you know, pushing you away. We talked about how color is one of the strongest um, indicators um, of a mood. You know, the color can really manipulate the viewer into feeling a certain way. Another thing that can really um, change the way that a viewer feels about an artwork or the sort of um, uh, um, emotion that an, a viewer gets from the artwork would be the rhythm uh, within it. And again, I'm sorry that my face is covering up part of that. So here we see in the upper left um, the three um, big rectangles with kind of cooler colors in it. That is a Mark Rothko piece, and it very much kind of reminds me of three really um, intense notes you know, kind of a long note a middle note and a, another note at the bottom and the colors are very um uh, dark in value they are imposing they are kind of beautiful but a little bit haunting and the this piece in terms of like the emotion that i would get from it uh, in the type of music that i would think of for this would be something um akin to when you, know, when you hear monks chanting, you know, just long notes, right? Long notes that are deep and um, kind of give a person a, 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 a sort of a religious feeling. Now, compare that to the upper middle piece. We've got lots of trees and they curve in this nice um, kind of arabesque shape and they um, just get a little bit smaller as they go along. And so we have a very um, clear rule set up, you know, like it's each one gets a little bit smaller and gets a little bit further down the picture plane and it all goes along this really smooth S curve. And because it follows this um, rule that was all these rules that were set up and it, it doesn't have a much of a break or a staccato element to it, we really get a, um, a smooth feeling from it. It's calming. Um, the colors also add to that calming effect because we've got this bright white um, in the clouds against the kind of a happy blue. And you can see that, that it's very similar to the blue in the Rothko in the middle, but that one, because it's against those other two bolder piece uh, colors um, that are also kind of very cool, it, you know, it reads very differently than the one in the middle. And so that one makes me think of a very light and charming kind of classical music, perhaps. Um, nothing intense like the Carmina Burana, but maybe something um, kind of light and cheerful. Okay. And on the bottom left, that piece certainly reminds me of jazz because it has um, it has rules, but the rules are broken a little bit. So we can think about this idea of improvisation in jazz. You know, you have a particular um, kind of notes that are what you would be expected to play, but then people um, when playing jazz often would improvise a bit and kind of break the rules and make it a little bit more fun. And so let me talk about what I mean by the rules in this piece. You can see that this orange background um, tends to have the uh, these funky little um, angular white and um, blue pieces within it. You can see along this edge here, it doesn't break the orange at all. Here along this edge, it doesn't break until we get to here. And then we've got this really naughty little piece that sticks out. <laughs> and even here, sticks out a little bit. And then we go back to the rule, right? And over here, it's just totally breaking the rule. And we have a staccato element, this big brown um, uh, piece that comes down. And so this piece, um, we know because the colors are uh, very bright and the colors are very uh, contrasting, you know, the blue and the orange, that it's meant to be kind of a fun, upbeat piece. Um, the angles all add to that kind of fun, up, up, upbeat, uh, funkiness to it. But the angles, although they go in different directions, they're all fairly similar to each other across. And so that's another kind of rule within the piece. Um, uh, so there is a sense of what the rules are meant to be in that piece, but they're broken. And that's a way to add kind of a sense of fun to um, an overall structure. And it's very different than what we see on the right here, which is a hellscape 
um, by Bosch. And so here we see kind of things everywhere. You know, it's almost a crystallographic composition. It's not quite because we do clearly have a focal point with this big, bright, white um, kind of demon slash building thing happening here. Um, but if you look across here, there are people being tortured in a myriad of ways. The, the only structure I really note in this piece is that, um, you know, things in the foreground are bigger, things in the background are smaller, and it tends to get darker as you move back in, in the picture plane. But the fact that there's just stuff everywhere and there are no rules um, beyond that very basic kind of setup um, makes the piece very hellish and kind of intense and overwhelming and kind of unpleasant to look at, you know? It's, I mean, it's a little bit fun to look and see how everybody's being tortured, but the overall sense from this piece is anxiety. And so I think the two, um, these two, these first two are the most um, structured and have the, the, the least amount of rule breaking. Um, and so they are super calming. This piece has, the on the right has, the most rule breaking um, happening and it, it creates a sense of anxiety. But if you want to create fun, if you want to have a fun, upbeat kind of mood, you want something in between. You want there to be rules, but you want to break them here and there. That gives the viewer a sense of kind of cheekiness and fun where the rules are being broken. But the fact that there are rules make the piece um, kind of not anxiety ridden and scary. And so you can think about what kind of mood you want to create in your piece. Um, and then kind of choose the layout based on that. Um, so here is a piece uh, by Mark Gertner, and this painting was made in the run-up to World War I. Um, Mark Gertner, the artist, was a conscientious objector, and he was alarmed by the rise of nationalism in Europe. And so he made this piece um, showing a bunch of, uh, kind of Europeans on a carousel, like screaming. <laughs> <laughs> because they can't get off, you know, they're on this ride and they don't want to be on the ride, but there they are. And he, he was comparing that to the feeling of uh, kind of this, this rise of nationalism and everybody kind of being kind of stuck in in this um, in this cycle. And so I think that this piece um, has similar colors to the the one I showed a moment ago that I said was kind of, was more fun and like more like akin to jazz um, with the blue and the orange. But it's not it's not as kind of fun of a mood because it also has these really um, dark and light elements to create this intense contrast. And um, although the figures are going in a circle and so it's a fairly predictable rhythm, they are taking up the entire picture plane. So in that way, it is a little bit like the Bosch hellscape too, where there's everything is everywhere and um, there's nowhere to rest the eyes. And so imagine any piece that has absolutely nowhere to rest the eyes can tend to make a, the viewer feel kind of anxious and overwhelmed. For your homework, I want you to make an image that creates mood with rhythm, and you can use any media and any method of doing this. And so I'm not going to give a demo for this because I think you have all of the tools that you need um, and all the information that you need to go ahead and do this on your own. But I am going to show you some examples of projects that students have done in the past. Here they are, um, and I have some of the uh, images that we saw of famous artworks during the lecture here to compare to some of what the students had done. So in the upper left, you see a drawing that someone created for this project, um, and it's looking down <coughs> from above at the pews of a church. And I put it next to the example with the trees and the arabesque S curve, because I think there's something similar between the two of them. The one with the, the trees going back, it's very calm and sort of cheerful and um, not, not, you know, doesn't kind of create any anxiety. It's, it's very predictable the way that it goes and it makes us feel very calm. Likewise, with the, um, the piece on the left, we see that the windows get smaller as you go back um, and the pews uh, should should do that too and the columns between the windows create shadows that are longer than the shadows on the pews where the windows are shining light through them and so we get this kind of very um, uh, predictable repetition that creates a, a rhythm and so i think these two have a very similar mood 
Now, if we look below, we have the uh, a student project on the left, which was the collage. Um, and in the middle bottom, we see the example from class that I said had a bit of a jazzy sort of setup because it set up clear rules and then it broke them here and there a little bit to create that sense of fun. The one on the left, uh, the collage the student made has a similar kind of setup because you'll see that she um, kind of created an idea of like rules in it, but that they go off of the go off in some places. So for example, if you look at the diagonal white um, shape that comes down, sorry, it's mirrored, that comes down um, from the upper right towards the middle, we see that within it, there's lots of little green uh, vertical and diagonal and horizontal stripes. And you also have red shapes, uh, red rectilinear shapes with green rectilinear shapes within them. And so we've got that structure of those shapes kind of sliding down um, that slide, <laughs> if you want to call it that. We also have another um, rule where there are um, yellow triangles, and sometimes the triangles have purple triangles within them, and they don't go up into that area, and they don't go into the, um, the triangles that uh, are the, the, the abutting parts of that um, diagonal. Um, <clears throat> but there are some places where this gets broken. And so you'll notice that the red shapes that the green are in also exist a little bit elsewhere um, and they overlap other areas. Um, she also has some organic shapes within a couple of the red and these are kind of little lines, but they're also a similar kind of green color to the um, the quadrilateral green shapes that are inside the red. Um, and let me just highlight that so you can see what I'm talking about right here and here. And so they sort of reference these green um, rectilinear shapes that are inside the other red ones um, in color, but they're very organic and different. So they break the rule a little bit there. And so I think she set up a kind of a fun, jazzy looking um, composition. Now let's look at the one to the far right bottom. This one also has a fun kind of feel to it. It almost looks like a lava lamp or undulating bodies dancing in the nightclub, something like that. Um, but he didn't necessarily set it up in the same kind of way where you lay down kind of a base structure and then you have things on top of it that either fit into that um, area that you've laid down as your background. Instead, he doesn't have necessarily background things and foreground things. They all seem to be within the same um, plane. Um, but he does keep it fun by you know, using really bright colors, of course. But he mostly sets up the rhythm by playing with the spaces between the shapes, um, the black negative space, and by playing with the um, sizes and widths of the undulating um, um, part, part circles that you see within there. Um, and so, like, for instance, we've got <clears throat> none of them touching anywhere, but in some places they get pretty close to touching. Like here, they're basically almost touching, and here they're almost touching. And in other spaces, they're kind of quite a bit further apart. And so I think he sets up kind of a fun um, system where they all don't have this rule where they all don't touch, but the amount that they get close to each other varies across the whole picture plane. So that's, that's kind of fun. Now, um, and also the colors help to keep it in that fun mood. So don't throw out the baby with the bathwater when it comes to creating mood with rhythm. Remember all the other things that um, affect mood too, like color. So if you look above, we see a piece that was done by a, a student in my class with the Heinz. And so it's a pretty, um, I would say standard rhythm. You know, we've got two circles. We've got um, the uh, the ketchup bottles all kind of facing towards kind of radial, uh, radial middle. Um, and so it would be pretty boring and static if it weren't for the fact that she serves in a staccato element with the green, um, the green relish bottle. So I think that adds a little bit of fun because it's it's uh, it breaks the monotony of what was happening besides that. And she also includes these background elements, these um, stringy things coming <laughs> down from behind. 
and a beach ball and a um, a beach umbrella also adds another kind of staccato element to it. And I think the rhythm here makes a lot of sense with what's happening um, because it's uh, it's a little bit fun, but it's also kind of um, calm. You know, it's not very exciting either. Um, and so it makes you think of a day at the beach where you're just sort of relaxing, reading a novel, like watching, you know, kids jump in the water and maybe you get in the water yourself. It's just a very laid back kind of fun, not a exciting kind of fun, like what you see below or to the far left. And so uh, here are some examples of what people have done to inspire you. In today's lecture, we covered uh, rhythm, of course. Um, and so I've listed a couple of the important uh, points around that here. But I have also listed all of the kind of general topics that we've covered in this course. And so it would be good to go back and review at this point to prepare for your um, your final project, which we'll be talking about after you turn in this, this current assignment. Um, but just screenshot this now so you can have a, a kind of a checklist where you can go back and make sure you've reviewed all these topics um, when we get to that. Okay. And, and so this is not the end of our course, um, but it is the very last video lecture. So um, I've had fun making these and um, interacting with you in class, and I'm sure the next couple of weeks will be great as well. So see you soon.